We're talking today about new plans for the 60-acre North Ventura area of Palo Alto, uh, plans that not only propose some housing, not a little housing, but a heck of a lot of housing, and depending on what quarter of the city you're in, that's greeted by cheers uh, or shock and awe, I believe one person uh, who you interviewed said, uh, Janati. So um, let's get right into um, the North Ventura area. Um, it's it's uh, south of California Avenue. Mm -hmm. Where do we stand in this process, which started two years ago? Well, we're now in the middle of the working group meetings. Um, mm -hmm. 14 residents who have been meeting uh, pretty regularly to discuss what the future should look like for Ventura. This is a coordinated area plan, so it's mm -hmm. not like a particular development proposal. It's more of a, a vision document. Mm -hmm. But it's important because um, in the context of the council's grant scheme for promoting housing, this is an example of the city swinging for the fences. If, if, if the ADU, the accessory dwelling unit stuff, is like a bunt and like <laughs> the, the housing incentive programs is like a base hit, this would be like, we can go big here and we can actually build hundreds of units as opposed to having like a few dozen. So it's been going through the process. It started in the fall of 18 and um, under the current schedule, which again, I'm tentative to kind of set it in stone because it's Palo Alto and things take a long time, but it should go to the council in May. Okay. Um, so uh, this consultant that they hired, uh, Perkins and Will, released some plans in December, but the working group only got to see it this month. Um, what are some of the, uh, the unexpected uh, elements of the plans? Well, let's say um, there were three alternatives that Perkins and Will and staff released at the January 21st meeting of, the, of this working group. Um, and the three alternatives range from around 900 housing units in the least ambitious scenario. We're talking like townhomes, apartments. Yeah. yeah. Uh, low rise, mid rise, words that are taking on new meanings in Palo Alto <laughs> with this plan. We can get to that later. Yeah. And at the upper end, it's about 26, 2700 units. Okay. Which is, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, now the housing element uh, that the city put together, it was, it was suggesting housing there. Mm -hmm. So what's the problem? Uh, magnitudes. Orders of magnitudes, um, and I'm not saying it's the problem. I'm just saying yeah. this is where it deviates from the city's right. uh, <laughs> uh, prior My plans. My problem was probably not the best one. Yeah, many <laughs> people say here's the solution, but depends on how you see it. But um, yeah, the city was envisioning about 220 some units um, at the 340 Portage where the Fries until recently uh, was occupying, and about like 350 units for the the greater interest site, like the the area around it. So mm -hmm. it was about 300. Fifty and so oh total total mm -hmm. and and the, the new um, the new plan is ob obviously magnitudes greater than that which I think is kind of surprised and shocked a lot of people as you, as you said yeah if you look at the um, renderings the maps that uh, go with the plans um, the housing doesn't seem to be focused on the portage site um, I think a couple of them one leading with legacy is actually mm -hmm. preserving mm -hmm. um, that building then there's adaptive core and designed diversity. I mean, the housing is, is all throughout the, um, that 60-acre area, fronting El Camino and then um, some on um, Oregon Expressway, Page Mill. Yeah, I mean, there is an effort to kind of uh, focus some of the new retail, um, like Long Portage, kind of create like a retail corridor. Mm -hmm. But even as part of that, the idea is you would need lots and lots and lots of residential development um, to support that retail. And on top of that, which I think many people aren't happy with, um, each of the scenarios we mentioned proposes new office space, which is pretty much the opposite of what mm -hmm. residents have been hoping for, mm -hmm. and is in some ways um, inimical to the council strategy, which has been setting up office caps and revising its comp plan to kind of lower, lower the ceiling on how much office should be allowed. So, and, um, and the reasons for that are economical, obviously, but. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that the uh, headline for your story is Reality Check. Mm -hmm. And um, I found it really eye-opening and interesting that the cost of the, just of building the apartments, and the cost of the apartments would be like $770,000. $700,000. Uh, excuse me, yeah. $700,000. Uh, Seven, yeah, yeah, you got it. <laughs> lots, anyway, of, lots, of lots of money that I can't even, see, yeah. that I can't even put together. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how is that ever going to be affordable? Part of this plan was that the idea behind it is that you would have affordable housing. And I can just remember some years ago uh, walking over on Park Boulevard and interviewing tech workers about whether or not if, if they built it, would they come? 
And they said no. They mm -hmm. wouldn't even move here because you'd have to put in basically a 50-story building that to have enough housing to have low, low enough prices for the housing for them to be able to move. So the tech here. workers were concerned that they wouldn't be able to afford the housing? That's right. They said just because we work in tech doesn't mean that we make enough money to live here. Well, I'd say that's also a reality check because the Ventura people would like to see teachers and firefighters and, you know, people who serve the community li like live in there. And if tech workers have told you that yeah, tech they, workers they, said they, it, yeah. they wouldn't be able to afford it, that's, um, yeah, that's... That's another reality check. I think yeah. some of the tech workers also they didn't want to say they didn't want to live here so close to their job. Yeah, that was the other <laughs> which thing. Which is yeah. which kind of a uh, paradox. They'd rather the live whole. in San Francisco or something where there's a little bit more action, more excitement. Yeah, there wasn't there wasn't anything really here to keep them here interested outside of lunch spots. That's it. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, in the Cal App area. Yeah. Um, so one person uh, who was talking about the housing said. Uh, can't remember who it was, uh, said this would be equivalent at the uh, most maximum housing plan, design diversity, of adding 10% of the city's population to 0.5% Yeah, that was Doria Suma, who, who okay. sits, sits in the working group and is also a planning commissioner. Yeah. Um, so, so obviously there's kind of different uh, takes on, on whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. Well, yeah, she's responding to the fact that uh, under the proposal there would be like 6,000 people added to the area, which... If you yeah. do simple math and have the current population, that's pretty accurate. It would be about 10% of the city living in this one little 60-acre area. Yeah. Uh, so uh, some people say that's, that's perfect. We have Caltrain here and there's transit, and especially if you add retail mm -hmm. and you already have jobs here and mm -hmm. you would add more jobs. Um, that's exactly what we need yeah. to, to, like, you know, to reduce vehicles, miles travel, to promote transit. But, um, you know... Any way you look at it, this would be a dramatic, dramatic upheaval of the neighborhood. Yeah. It would look nothing like it looks like today. And few would suggest that this is in any way adaptive kind of mm. use of what's there right now. Yeah, going to former Mayor Karen Holman's point in your article that mm -hmm. maybe the vision um, that the council had initially of like open space and community spaces, minimal traffic, um, all that doesn't quite square with the three plans that Perkins and Will has proposed, at least that was her take on, mm -hmm. on them, being uh, of greater density. So you have in one corner the people who are saying, we want housing but not this much, and or it needs to be affordable, how are we ever going to get there? Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, people who say, well, just give us some housing because in the future Palo Alto is going to be required um, to have a lot more housing than it does right now. Yeah, and I think pretty much everyone who, who I've spoken to who have heard speak at meetings um, recognizes that, that there will be more housing, or that at least that there should be more housing. Mm -hmm. But I think most people looked at the city's housing element and the kind of two to 300 kind of number as kind of the upper end or at least the, the baseline. Yeah. And seeing like the Overton window shift like a mile to the right. <laughs> so it's, now we're looking at 900 to 3,000. That's like pretty dramatic. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a changing the conversation. So... Um, yeah. That's kind of where we are right now. Let's talk low. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. You go first. I was going to say, let's just talk low rise and mid rise for a second because when mm -hmm. we talk about types of housing, what um, do the consultants think that would look like? Um, well, in, in these plans that were released in January 21st, um, mm -hmm. a low rise building is four stories basically. Mm -hmm. And there's also something called a low rise with commercial where you would have retail on the ground floor mm -hmm. and then the quote unquote low rise. And I say quote unquote because many people are offended by the idea that. This would now be like a five-story building, or they wouldn't call that low. They definitely would not call that low. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's like 800 High Street. Yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then the mid-rise would be, in their example, something that could be as tall as like eight stories, mm -hmm. 85 feet tall. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. some of the more higher growth examples, like the, the scenarios with more housing. Yeah. They would have mid-rise of like eight-story buildings, and and there's different designs. Some of them would have like big courtyards centrally, and like apartment buildings surrounding it. Mm -hmm. Others would have less green space but more units. Um, they kind of, these are basically the different building blocks that the consultants are playing with and trying to get to these numbers. Yeah. yeah. I have a question for you. Do you recall the uh, amount of space that the city and the county purchased with um, Buena Vista? Is that, was it more than two acres? Because I know the 
original site, the entire site. It was 2.64, wasn't it? Okay. I, I, I right. don't recall exactly, but. Okay, so the, wow. there's about. Sort of like 2.64. Okay, all right. <laughs> sort of. I'll, need, I'll, need, I'll need to fact check that. Okay, okay, okay. so for yeah. example, there's, let's say, there's 100 residences or 100, 100 units are on that 2. 6-4 acre site. Hypothetically, because I haven't verified. <laughs> okay. All right. But all right, roughly, uh, we mm -hmm. know it's not the four points, whatever right. it was, because that would encourage, that would include the commercial strip that mm -hmm. is not part of this deal, Right, was not part of the deal. Uh, so my question is, is I just did a little bit of math and I'm terrible at math. However, I'm so excited about whatever question is coming right now. Okay. So <laughs> if we're talking about 60 acres, uh, I figured out, I kind of divided that by to uh, roughly two, you know, the two acre site essentially. So that would be 30 times 100 people. So that's about roughly, um, if, if you had the same density essentially as you would at Buena Vista on the Fry site, on that whole site there, it'd be about 3,000 people or 3,000 units, right? Is my math correct? Yeah. So okay. So so, 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 so I mean, yeah, check back with me in an hour. <laughs> well, so the plans range from uh, 950 units to they think they can get 2,600 units, and I think at the top mm -hmm. end at 2,600 you get 6,700 6, people. Oh, I see. 6,700 because yeah, you're, keep, you're keep, figuring it. Well, keep, keep in mind, so no, one, no one's talking about yeah. developing the whole thing for housing. They're also right. introducing retail and office. Uh, there's yeah. some. There's some open space involved, and there's the creek running right, through it, okay. so there's various limitations. Uh, some of the high-growth scenarios would have like a separate garage with the idea that most of the parking would be underground. Okay. I think it's proposed to be at the Equinox building. Okay. Mm. So, so you uh, wouldn't have the same... De I was just trying to look at, you know, envision having walked at uh, mm -hmm. Buena Vista so many times and seeing the little courtyards and, the you know, the, the passageways and the roads between. Uh, if, is it unrealistic? To say that you you know to to even have let's say two thousand units, but you're saying there are so many other things, other mm -hmm. factors in there. We're not just going for pure housing or pure row housing. So yeah, and I and I certainly know. wouldn't expect it to be a layout to to look like anything like Buena Vista. I don't think if you were designing anything from scratch, you would choose like single story, uh, right. whether it's mobile homes or even like townhouses. If, if your goal is to like, some, like maximize housing, I mean I think it's kind of illustrative that the lowest example calls for like four-story buildings and calling them low-rises. Okay. So, yeah, so I, I, expe I expect it to be much it. more compact, whatever yeah. they come up with, much more compact, but there would be a lot of other things besides housing. Right. Can we talk about the surprise uh, that came out from Tim Steele and of the Sobrato organization? Mm -hmm. uh, Target? Target moving in? Uh, potentially. Uh, they've been, there's been a lot of interest from Target, apparently. Mm -hmm. the, uh, Tim Steele, who uh, works with Sobrato organization, which owns the site, says... Target's been very persistent in trying to come in to the site, mm -hmm. which, I don't know, I think few, few would imagine that that's, that, that comports to the original vision of, that, that's been bandied about in the past, right. which is like beer gardens and retail <laughs> and food and food trucks and kind of a community yeah, hub. Yeah, very small. I mean, you could talk to your neighbors at Target, I suppose. That's, mm -hmm. that's nothing against Target, but it just, uh, when, when I've seen renderings in the past of what Ventura could look like, and when I heard like 100 people speak about it, no one said we really would like to see a Target here. Yeah. Well, and the Target in East Palo Alto does have a does have a Starbucks in it. That's cool. People go to Starbucks. Yes. <laughs> Community <laughs> space. Yeah, but um, you know, Palo Alto has been generally against big box stores, and they've been very much against uh, mm -hmm. chain stores, with some exceptions, like aforementioned Starbucks, mm -hmm. especially in the Cal Avenue area, which is seen as kind of a more kind of eclectic neighborhood serving type area. Mm -hmm. So. Target w wouldn't really fit in with that vision too well, even if it's a the kind of baby target they call it as they propose it, which is like or between 12,000 and 35,000 square feet, much smaller than most. It would kind of blend into a place. So yeah. that's kind of what they're looking at, like a small target that kind of adjusts itself to the community as opposed to something you would see at like ceremony or whatever. Yeah, well, that space is currently unoccupied mm -hmm. and Sobrato owns it and they have the right to put whoever they want in there, yeah, right? So, yep. so there's vi we're talking vision, but we're but in this instant, we're also just talking about uh, a property owner doing what they want with their building, like right now. Well, so that could that could move in, right? And the city doesn't have any could, leverage they, not they, to the target could move in. Yeah. yeah. I have a couple of questions for you. One, is it about math? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> if, if it is, please direct it to Justin. <laughs> well, anyway, one of the things I was going to ask you is is that 
it sounds like Sobrato doesn't have any big plans to build there right now to do any construction. That's accurate. But the, but the city council in 2006, I thought this was interesting in your story, voted to eliminate the 20-year amortization provision, right, that would have basically required, reverted back to making that residential use mm -hmm. um, as of July of 2019. Mm -hmm. So they could have, did, did they throw away the leverage they would have with Sobrato uh, when they voted to, you know, not do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think about the city's housing plans and I read the 2006 minutes and I bang my head on the table. <laughs> yeah, I mean, had the zoning been that's been in place in, in the early 2000s, kind of had things proceeded according to the plan, last July, July 2019, RM30 would have been rule of the land. You can't use any more commercial. Uh, but as you mentioned, 2006, the, the city planners at the time were no longer there, but they, they decided that we really want Fry's to stay for as long as possible. They're one of the top 10 revenue generators, so we should do everything we can to be nice to them. So they basically erased the 20-year amortization date, so the July 2019 reversion did not happen. The non-conforming use is in place in perpetuity, which gives Sobrato the leverage that we just talked about. It, to yeah, get. there goes their leverage. Yeah, yeah and they, they have some leverage. They could do another amortization study, which they might talk about it actually mm -hmm. this Monday. It's part of the housing work plan to see whether they want to do that and kind of establish a new time limit. Mm -hmm. But even if they do that, you have to do a study, and once the study comes out, it'll tell you how many years you have to wait to give the developer a chance to kind of get out of all the existing leases and mm. get the money's worth. Um, so it would, it would take a long time under any scenario. So also, uh, what about the possibility? Uh, well, uh, two questions again. One is, what is the, uh, what kind of pressure is the city under um, statewide or regionally to build more housing? Can we talk about that a little bit? No, that's a great question. And I think... The easy, the easy answer is the city doesn't know yet. Um, there, there are arena allocation targets which the city has been missing religiously. They're doing okay in like the, uh, the higher income categories, but when you talk about like below market rate units, you can pretty much count on one hand how much it builds per year. Um, there's some changes with the Wilton Court project com coming on construction, possibly starting later this year, which should be a 59 BMR units. But um, the arena cycle is going to come to an end and there's going to be another one. And so the, the MTC or ABAG, the, the Sacramento agencies, whatever, um, or, or Oakland agency, MTC, uh, is going to come in and basically it's expected to dramatically increase the allocation. And so the city is going to have to not build housing, but at least show where it could build housing. And, where, and, and it's supposed to take actions to zone for the housing. And there's also all these initiatives in Sacramento. We saw this week SB50 went down. But there's still a lot of pressure in Sacramento to kind of beef up the arena process, put some teeth into it. So it's quite possible that in addition to having way more housing allocations, there might actually be some, uh, you know, actual action from the state requiring the city to comply with these numbers as opposed to just create some pie in the sky scenarios that the city is not going to meet. Okay. So we don't know yet because the cycle hasn't come out and the legislation is still kind of going through its process, but I think we could expect the pressure to increase. It's only going to get harder to kind of meet the state targets. Okay, I have one last question for you, and it goes right back to Buena Vista. This small piece of property was deemed really valuable for, for low-income uh, low housing. Mm -hmm. The city and the county put a tremendous amount of money into purchasing that property. Is there any possibility that the city, you know, what would it look like if the city purchased the Fry's property and then they could do what they want with it, put as much housing, you know, if it's really valuable, is this something that might possibly happen or could happen? I don't think it could and here's why. I think it would cost a few hundred million dollars to buy that. Um, we know how much it costs to build affordable housing. Just buying the land would cost a fortune and then the city had just spent $20.5 million just given out in loans to support a 59-unit project. That's just a part of what it costs to develop that project. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking like hundreds of millions of dollars to buy the land and to construct the kind of housing that we're talking about here. Um, this, and money doesn't really take you a long way because there's so many other things to consider, construction costs, land costs. And uh, so you need like a massive amount of spending 
to realize that kind of vision if the city owned the site. And um, they, they discussed just last week the potential of kind of having a business tax to pay for affordable housing. And I think during that discussion, council members pretty much recognized that transportation should be the focus, and partly that's because the city has so few options of actually spending money and getting enough affordable housing. You could help around the edges, you could mess with zoning, you could do certain things as a, as a city council, but actually like building public housing, it would take like massive bonds and it would take humongous expenditures. And I just, I can't see the city going down that route, at least anytime soon, especially when you have competing priorities like Cumberly Community Center, which could also have housing in it potentially. And you know, all the other things that, that are in the infrastructure plan. Yeah. So given the costs, Basically, of uh, housing is the whole concept of is the whole concept of afford of meaningful affordable housing, meaningful housing. What is, is meaningful housing? Well, something that people could actually afford. Mm -hmm. It would be affordable housing. So sixty percent AMI or lower, like the the, the low, the very low income category stuff. Right? Okay, is that even realistic anymore? Is it you know should we even be discussing it or basically give up on it at this point? Well, Wilton Court is happening, so. Uh, <laughs> It's progress. The city hasn't done anything for years and years, and that's happening. And they're easing up some zoning rules to kind of encourage some more. And also, like um, I think it's worth pointing out that if even if you have market rate housing, the city still has this inclusionary zoning rule where 15% has to be BMR. And it's probably not going to be the kind of meaningful affordable housing you're talking about. It would probably be more moderate because of the whole pencil out thing. So yeah, when I say meaningful, yeah. I meant in terms of quantity. Mm. Okay, well, let's bring the it. topic back to North Ventura. Very okay, tough. sorry. Very difficult. Uh, not impossible, but very expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even with these two 2,600 potential uh, house, houses, apartments, mm -hmm. townhomes, it doesn't seem like there's many uh, BMRs No, there would uh, be a 15, there. The 15 percent thing would kick in, but who's to say that that's not going to be like moderate income yeah. that's, that's, that could support uh, Sue's tech worker friends, but maybe not teachers and, you know, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Um, so just ending on process then, um, this, this um, planning effort has gone through a lot of hiccups. Um, there's been um, the Fry site and its historic uh, designation. There's Sobrato not wanting to build housing there. Um, the working group, I understand, was not getting certain information uh, quickly from the staff last year. There's some complaints about that. Where do we stand now that there are three plans out on the table? Is the working group going to continue um, vetting these? Um, when does it get to the council? There's going to be a community meeting um, sometime in February. There's going to be more meetings of the working group. Mm -hmm. It's expected to get to council in May. I wouldn't be surprised if that's extended, but I don't know at this point. Um, and, you know, there's been other hiccups we can mention, too. We don't have to go back to the MAGA hat thing. <laughs> that was a member of the Ventura <laughs> right. group. Right. Uh, the there were not approved for the there, contractor. There were, there were squabbles between the city and Perkins and Will about the scope of the contract. There, were, there was a recent attempt as early as December to add money to the contract, which the council rejected, even though the majority voted for it. So uh, the city is trying to do like kind of more with less right now in this process. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think it's a good milestone that these alternatives were released, even if they're pissing a lot of people off, because at least... It gives you a chance to talk about something and adjust plans accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, from the process side, I think these are going to get more visibility in the next couple of months as the city invites the community to weigh in, as the working group kind of offers more feedback, and ultimately as a guest to the city council, and the council gives its own direction. Okay, well, it's it maybe not the most ambitious plan that uh, the city had proposed two years ago, but it's still happening, and there's a, a, a lot to discuss there. We're swinging for the fences here. Yep. All right. Well, thanks, Janati, for bringing that. And thanks, Sue, for the good questions. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, that wraps up this edition of Behind the Headlines. Thanks for watching. If you think there's other people who might be interested in uh, this topic, go ahead and share this, the link to this video uh, with the share button below. Um, to stay up uh, on all of Palo Alto's news, go to paloaltoonline.com or find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. We'll see you next week.